Bibles and turn to 1 Peter this morning, 1 Peter chapter 3. That's where we're looking at today as we begin in our fourth lesson in our Sunday School series on a firm foundation. A firm foundation. We do desire to build a household of faith on the unchanging principles and promises of the Word of God. And so this morning, we're looking at lesson four, which is dealing with healing a hurting home. We've dealt with several things like the marriage relationship in the first two chapters or lessons in this curriculum. Uh, We dealt with faith in God's plan for marriage. And then we also dealt with unity together in marriage. Uh, And then last week, we looked at the family a little bit. And this morning, we're continuing with that idea and that thought, but along the lines of healing a hurting home. So we look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and we begin in verse number 1 where the word of God says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation or the lifestyle of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating the hair or the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. Notice that that statement is not saying that you shouldn't go without, for it says, you know, talks about the apparel, you need to put on the apparel, amen. So it's not saying, you know, don't do anything with your hair, don't do anything with jewelry, or don't do anything without clothes. What it is saying is it's going to be the inward man that is going to change the husband who is erring is what it's talking about here. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy woman also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, 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 ye husbands, dwell with them, your wife, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Notice the overview on your page. Uh, many marriages are crumbling today. God is the great physician. He has a remedy that can cure any problem in the marriage of any one of us. We must first be willing to learn and follow his prescription for a hurting home to truly be healed. And I guarantee it that you do not have to look far, uh, whether it's here or at work or just around the life in general, you can find hurting people, you can find hurting families. We live in such a day, as I emphasize over and over again, uh, that the devil's favorite playground is the family. And we are praying today that we will have a ministry in the Word of God that will change that. Let's pray together and let's ask God to help those families that are hurting. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you this morning, uh, we are trusting that you will take your eternal words that are always and already settled in heaven. And we are asking that every pure word would pierce our hearts today. That if we are dealing personally with situations where there's hurt involved, that we would know where to turn and who to turn to. But then, Lord, as we see others who are hurting, I pray that we would be able with a meek and quiet spirit to bear the burdens with others around us. I pray that you would give us this ministry of mercy, grace, and love, that we may see the ministry of reconciliation, whether in our midst or outside of this place, to be able to be fruitful in these ways. Lord, heal our homes. And we ask all this now in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said, Amen.
Now, we know that there's tremendous differences that exist between men and women. Those differences are according to the design and plan of God. But sometimes we will look at those differences and we will play them against the plan of God or we will handle them, whether as the person or with the other person, in a way that we should never do. Often these differences are not apparent prior to marriage. It sometimes takes living together in the same house to bring them to light. And thus we understand that sometimes the crumbling begins to happen without even realizing it before the relationship gets very in-depth. But God designed marriage to be permanent. And all God's people said, Amen. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God designed marriage to be permanent. His plan is that your relationship will last as long as you both shall live. Even if you are in a situation where there seems to be no hope, listen, God has a plan to heal your hurting home. So what does it take this morning? What does it take tomorrow? What does it take in the future year from now to heal a hurting home? Let's find out today as we get in the Word of God. Number one, living humbly. Living humbly. As you are in 1 Peter, we're going to look together at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1 again. Where the Bible says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. We are dealing with our first point, living humbly together. And we're going to touch on both sides of things and before all, uh, even though the verse deals with just in the wife to the husband situation. But the Bible right here tells that wives are to have a spirit of submission to their husbands. But submission is a two-way street. The Bible also tells that husbands are to be in mutual submission to their wives. For the picture is the understanding that yes, Christ is the head of the church. But Christ, the Bible says there in Ephesians 5, gave himself for the church. There has to be submission in that given for that love to be understood. And so as we move forward, we realize that it is possible for two people to live in this way. It is possible for a family to lay and live in this way. How can someone lay down his weapons and mutually submit in marriage? And the answer will always be humility. I remind you of what James chapter 4 and verse number 10 says. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Isn't that what we desire in our church? Isn't that what we desire in our relationships outside of church? Isn't that what we desire in our families, that that God would lift us up? The first step to the revival and restoration of a home or family or a church is humility. We must admit that we need help and that we are willing to get it. But we don't look to wherever, we look to God. Amen. We look to his word. Letter A today, we need to have a humble life before God. We need to live humbly before God. Living humbly before God is an issue of the heart. Even though there is nothing wrong with caring for the externals and what everybody else sees, the first focus should be what is within. For it is within the man that affects the man. So we realize that if within is right before God, the externals are going to come. It's going to be a desire of our heart. Humility comes from the heart that is yielded and dedicated to following the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants the emphasis to be on the heart. The hidden man of the heart is your inward self. He wants your heart to be tender and open toward Him. If your heart is hard toward God, it cannot be tender toward your family. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
If we're all bitter against God and angry at Him for something, then it's going to be very hard to be tender to our family because the wall has been built. Because God resists the proud. The Bible says there in James 4, as well as humble yourself, the Bible says that God resists those who are prideful. And we must come to the place where we are willing to say, God, I need your help. Isn't that what David said? I believe it's in Psalm 12 where he lifts up his voice and he says, Help, Lord. Help, Lord. Help, Lord. And that would be the desire of anyone in a hurting situation. We look at B, A, before God, B, before one another. We live humbly before God, and we should live humbly before one another. The Bible does not teach a chauvinistic domination of women by men. It doesn't teach that. God's plan is for the man to be a servant leader just as Christ would wash the disciples' feet, just as Christ would give himself for the church. Christ is the picture of the husband in that Ephesians chapter 5. And me, me, me as a husband, I need to know what it means to be a servant leader to my wife and to give myself over for my wife regardless of how my my wife would treat me. Uh, if your spouse would see you humbling yourself, it will greatly help repair the damages of the past. Listen to Proverbs 13 and verse 10. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. We were playing a game last night with one of our church kids, and there was a question in this Bible trivia pursuit uh, that asked this. What will be the outcome if you have wise friends? And of course, there's a Bible verse that goes with it. It's not this one. But the outcome really is very simple. If you're around wise friends, you yourself are going to be wise. And this kid got it right. I was so excited as pastor. We think about wisdom in the Bible, and the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. And that's something that we need to seek after more than silver in our life. And we need wisdom to know, how do I live humbly before God? How do I live humbly before other people? people, my vertical relationship, my horizontal relationship, I want it to be right with the Lord and others. If there are contention and strife in your home, they are indications of pride rather than humility. To heal a home, you must begin by humbling yourself to God and to each other. Be willing to admit when you are wrong about something. Apologize for offenses before you are asked to do so. Take the initiative to try to make things right. It is of utmost value before God, the marriage relationship. He created the relationship, and that is the family unit. That's where it begins. God values that relationship, and we ought to be willing to do something to fight for it. So we live humbly. And number two, we live helpfully, living helpfully. We look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 2, and we are reminded of the statement, while they, referring to the husbands, while they behold your, the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, that modest conversation, that sober lifestyle, while they behold that conversation coupled with fear, a reverence and a respect that the lady has, as for the man, it is ultimately going to cause that lost man to consider some things. And I've brought it up quite a bit recently, but we praise God for what God did in the Aish family. According to this verse, that is an example before your eyes of a lady married to a man that desired to see God magnified in that relationship. And this pastor is loving to see the steps that are taken, not just by the individuals, but by the couple together. It's exciting to be able to see an illustration of these verses come alive in one of our own families. So living helpfully is how continuance is going to take place. Conversation refers to our manner of living or pattern of being 
behavior. Don't get confused. It's not just a talk. It's an old English word for the manner of living or a pattern of behavior that one has. The way we should live should be pure. Well, that simply should make sense this morning. Peter told the women in the early church that if their husbands were not saved, they could win them. Not by constantly nagging them or pushing gospel tracks in their face, but by living a lifestyle and a godly testimony before them. Part of God's prescription for healing is that our lives are to be helpful to the other person. Too often the home is a source of frustration rather than encouragement in a hostile world. One of the symptoms of an unhelpful home is that each spouse waits for the other to take the first step. That is always a recipe for failure. I'm so thankful that Christ wasn't waiting for us to take the first step, but that He, as the picture of the husband, took the first step for us and gave His life and dedicated Himself as a servant to our aid eternally. Letter A, a helpful wife is a godly wife. The Bible describes the model wife as a virtuous or godly woman and says that she is of great value, of great price, and there's no ruby that can be compared to her, a Proverbs 31 woman, since he knows the husband that he can trust her, the wife. He, the husband, is not under pressure to try to buy her affection as it would emphasis, emphasize in Proverbs 31, verse 11. Her commitment to caring for her family frees him to play a leadership role within the household and within the community, as it would also say in Proverbs 31. Our ladies went through Proverbs 31 together, and we appreciate their desire to learn that. But we must understand that every relationship is two-sided. And as a lady be and dedicated to helping a family, your family, means that you're committed to use your talents and the abilities that God has given to you to make your family a safe place, to make your family a better place for the glory of God. Ladies, it's not just your husband's responsibility. Yes, he's leading, but according to Proverbs 31, you have a vital role in making your family what it is for the glory of God. Our ladies are very important. L relationship ladies in the homes, if it's hurting, the first step is committing yourself to live humbly and then to be helpful in the home. But I'm not just going to talk to the ladies this morning. I'm going to talk to the men as well because that's what we need to do. Letter B, a helpful husband is a godly husband. Uh, it probably on your app, if you're using the app, it's got two blanks there. Uh, one would be Christ and the other would be like Christ-like. A helpful husband is a Christ-like husband. God does not intend for the husband to be the dictator in his home. I believe that God has ordained the husband to be the head of the home, though. God never calls a leader to exercise dominion of his followers but the Bible teaches us the principle that the greater one that is among you is the one who is least, the one who is the servant of all. And that's how Christ led his disciples. That's how Christ leads his church. Even though he's called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he is unlike any king or dictator that we have ever understood. And his servant mindedness and leadership really sets that apart in our understanding. The love that God commands a husband to have for his wife is the same love that Jesus showed for his church. A sacrificial love. He gave himself, willing to lay down his life for the church. That is a high standard. Yet God never commands us to do anything that is impossible to accomplish His will. He gives us help to be able to do this. This means that a husband can love his wife with a sacrificial love every single 
day. It helps the relationship. It strengthens the relationship, gentlemen, when we love our wives with the same type of love that Christ has given to the church. Christ's love for the church was a serving love, not just sacrificial. As we think about the story where he would stoop down and wash the disciples' feet, it was an expression of humility and service. I commit myself to you in the most disgusting of circumstances, the most unsanitary of circumstances. I commit myself to you and I wash the lowest part of your feet. Jesus is sharing an expression of humility and service and husbands. What a great example to us that is to think of our wives as worthy of doing anything for them, to take care of them and their well-being. Husbands, this is the pattern that God expects us to follow towards our wives. Christ-like love does not allow marital problems to linger unresolved. Notice, I did not say that Christ-like love will keep the problems away. We live in a sinful flesh, and we are not Christ. Amen. We're going to see problems arise. We're going to have problems come. But if we can find out how are we going to submit, how are we going to continue to love, how are we going to live humbly and helpfully, this will allow problems to go away. God can do that. There is a remedy, and it always begins with him. So we've looked at living humbly. We've looked at living helpfully. But I want to deal with the last point for a little while, and that is living honorably. Living honorably. The final step to restoring a damaged relationship and healing a hurting home is bringing honor back to your home. Honor is usually one of the first casualties in a damaged relationship. Rather than treating our spouses with respect, you begin to think and perhaps even say unkind and cutting things. Maybe directly to them, maybe behind their back, maybe to the children. Living honorably means that we're going to stop that. Words have tremendous power. The words you use either build up or they tear down in a relationship. And we can all think of situations, whether within our home or whether the things we've seen outside, where words tear up or words build up. God's design is for families to have honor in the home. There are two key ingredients of living a life that honors your spouse. And the first one begins with dwelling with knowledge. Letter A, dwelling with knowledge. Honor requires understanding. You cannot properly express honor within the home unless you understand, here it is, the needs, the personality, and the inward desires of your spouse. Now, she may like something different than you do, but the Bible says dwell with her according to knowledge. What are her needs, gentlemen? What is her personality? Is she going to like this? What's the inward desire of your spouse? To have hope for the healing of your home, you need to replace hostility with honor in your home. And I dare say that if you have a home that lives humbly, a home that helps one another, and a home that lives honorably, there might be some in the community that looks at that as weak. But I'm telling you, the home and the relationship has never been stronger as when mom and dad or husband and wife live with honor with each other, live helpfully with each other, and live humbly before each other, before God, and before other people. So how do I dwell with knowledge? Number one, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. It's always exciting, isn't it, when we earn quote-unquote brownie points. And that can be done. Ask God for wisdom. God, how do I meet the needs, meet the personality, meet the inward desires of my spouse? I am not interested in meeting the needs, personality, or desires of another person's spouse. I want to meet the needs of my own spouse. Take your Bible and go to Proverbs with me if you would. I want to share some verses with you here in the book of Proverbs. As we're turning to Proverbs, we're going to look at chapter uh, number 5.
Proverbs chapter number 5. And gentlemen, I want to encourage you with the verses that we're going to read here in Proverbs 5 along the lines of dwelling with your wives according to knowledge and respect of which we are dealing with within this point of living honorably with them. The Bible says in verse 14 of Proverbs 5, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. By the way, it doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter what house of worship you attend. You can be right in the middle of a God-fearing congregation and still be almost in all evil. Then look at what it says in verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. What are we talking about in verse 15? We're talking about don't steal. There's a fountain over there, or, you know, back in the day, there was a well over there in that person's house, but I have my own, but for whatever reason, I like their water better because you get your eyes off of yours. And you go over to that water, you draw from it, but what you are doing is you're taking from that household when you should never do so because that water's not yours, this water's yours. Look at what it says in verse 16. Let the fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed. And here it is, gentlemen. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Your wife. Not somebody else's. Let her be as the loving hind in pleasant row. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. Verse 20. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquities, not somebody else's, your own iniquities, gentlemen, shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. You want a remedy? You want to be able to cut those cords? Get your eyes on the right place. Get your life with the right one. Then verse 23, here's what it says about the man who continues after another. He shall die without instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. I've always been amazed at that statement in verse 23, the greatness of his folly. And you think about the pleasure of sin for a season and how great it seems. I'm getting away with this. I'm enjoying this. But really, in the end, you'll find out it was a very devastating, devastating to your own self and possibly to others way to go. So we dwell with our own wives, gentlemen, according to knowledge. We ask God for wisdom. Many things can damage your home, yourself, outside influences, people within your home. Harsh and abusive words from the husband destroy the wife's desire for intimacy and fellowship. Cruel and belittling remarks from the wife destroy the husband's initiative and leadership. You can create a hard and calloused spirit with your words and even with your actions. How much better is it to ask God to fulfill or to fill your words with understanding and grace so that they may build your relationship? So at dwelling with knowledge, we ask God for wisdom. Then number two, we listen. You cannot expect to bring honor to your home by dwelling with understanding unless you take time to stop and listen to what your spouse is saying. You've heard it before. We like to fix things. And the moment the words start coming out of the, uh, the lady's mouth, we've got a three-step way to fix the problem, don't we, gentlemen? Well, this is how you need to do it. This is what's going to take care of it. And I can't see why you just can't give in to it. This is how it's done. You know, sometimes it would be better for our relationship if we would just listen. Because that's what they want. Needs, personalities, inward desires, and they just want a listening ear in the situation. Uh, I've been around uh, many situations where somebody wanted to talk about something. And in most cases, as I look back on it, they just wanted somebody to pour their heart out to. They just wanted somebody to listen. And I constantly will say something like this in those situations that there's many times that I don't have the answer or I don't know what to do, but I know who does. And when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And if there's anyone who knows how to answer this situation or fix this problem, it is God. But you have no idea how much in a rare relationship it helps when you listen to the other person. 
A wife is wise to listen to her husband's needs. A husband is wise to do the same. Husbands need approval from their wives. So often a couple will come in and they'll talk and they'll discuss things in their relationship as they've done before in the past with me. And men who do not receive approval at home are dangerously vulnerable to the temptation of looking outside the home for approval. This happens. And for those of you who are involved in a secular business somewhere uh, where you have both men and women, you can probably stop and think about or you have seen the situations come alive where you understand that even though you don't know that person very well, you know that they are being unfaithful or starting to be unfaithful because that person begins to look for approval in other places and you know something, you know that they're probably not getting it at home. Uh, There's no relationship growth at home, but rather it's being torn apart on both ends. And if someone ever starts acting like that to you, you would be very wise not to cave in to giving them that approval that they need, but help guide that heart to God, help guide that heart to understand they have someone at home that they need this relationship strengthened with. Letter B, as we seek to close things off on living honorably with the other person, we dwell with them according to knowledge, and then we dwell with respect. You can restore honor in your marriage through respect. Disrespect is like an acid that eats away at the fabric of your relationship. If you want to receive respect, you have to sow respect by building up your spouse. There's two ways that we can build up our spouse or live with respect toward the other one, and that is, number one, with our actions. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So what we do, what we say, these two things are going to make a difference. So we begin with our actions. The way we treat each other should bring glory to God. Can you treat your spouse harshly in the name of God? of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the answer is no, you can't. I I like to see husbands who have been married for, like for instance, this past uh, jolly 60s, uh, we had, uh, uh, I believe it was my grandparents that raised their hands and I think they said 63 years. I forget exactly, I think it's 63. And uh, wow, wow. I mean, every time we have, you know, the Jolly 60s folks give their anniversary date and how many years, we we give them claps. And those that have been married for a long time, we we say, thank you for setting the example for us. And it's just always sweet and neat to see how those who have been married for years and years together still look like they're in love. And that encourages us to say, you know what, when we get to be older... We want to have that as well. But guess what? Just because we get 50 years married or get 60 years married or get 65 years married or even get 70 years married doesn't mean it's going to be the switch that clicks on. Oh, lovey-dovey all over them. It begins today. Loving the other person in our actions and then number two with our words. Don't say hurtful, wicked things to your spouse. Don't talk about things that your spouse cannot change. Do not compare your spouse to others. That could be very harmful in your marriage. Do not compare the shortcomings or point them out. You cannot have a healing in your house if the words you begin to speak are bitter and painful. The words you use reveal what you truly think about your spouse. Make sure that your words are building your relationship rather than tearing it down down. I think of another verse in Colossians, Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 6, let your speech be always with, you know it, grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Our speech is important. You may have reached a point where you feel that it is impossible for God to heal this hurting situation. But I want to remind you, especially at this time of the year as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I believe any marriage can be transformed with right living. I believe that any marriage can be transformed with God 
honoring God, helping God humbling ways in our life. I believe we can see revival and restoration. That's what we're here for. And we look for in our individual lives before God, humility, helping, honoring. We look for in our relationships with our friends, in our relationships with our spouses, with our children, with outside people. We, we look and we say, okay, how can I live humbly? How can I live helpfully? How can I honor the other involved? You cannot expect the effect of accumulated offenses to be forgotten overnight. But as your spouse sees a new lifestyle on your part, he or she will begin to respond. And in time and by the grace of God, God can restore your marriage. God can restore your family. God can restore your individual relationships. God can restore your relationship with Him. And He can satisfy the deep needs of your heart, there is a remedy. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you this morning, we come humbly and we understand that there's no one better to understand our personal failures than our own selves. And so we admit our pride because we know that your Bible says that you resist the proud. We don't want you resisting us. But rather, we want to resist the devil, and he will flee. And so I pray that this morning, that's where we'll begin. Any pride that could be there, we'll remove it. We'll desire to live humbly, as your verse says. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Then, Lord, we desire to be helpful. I pray that, first of all, we would seek your help. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, the faithful fail from among the children of men. And then help us to be helpful to others, not lazy, not disrespectful. I, I pray that we would live in such a way that we would help the other. Put others first. Prefer them before us. And then, Lord, help us to honor with respect and with knowledge. Help us to honor the others in our life. Whether it's a position of authority or whether it's our God-given spouses children. Help us to honor each one as individuals, but most of all, help us to honor you. I pray that we would be reminded this morning of who you are, and all glory and praise and honor and power be to the Lamb that was slain. We ask this now in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said,